All right, then, moving on, we're now in part 10 on Wolves in Costume, Stephen Anderson. If you'd like to follow along, you can, you can go to creationliberty.com, type in the word Steve, S-T-E-V-E, -E, into the search bar there, and that will give you the article, Wolves in Costume, Stephen Anderson, or if you're listening by YouTube, there should be a link in the description, and that should take you to the article. You're just going to have to scroll down to where we are. Now, last week, we left off talking about Stephen Anderson, and I'll, obviously, well, duh, I meant, to, I meant to continue that sentence. Start off talking about Stephen Anderson's teaching on tithing. He has a teaching called Tithing in the New Testament. And I'll quote this again as we read it last week. He said, quote, This doctrine of tithing has come under attack recently. If you notice who's behind the attack on tithing, it's people who are against going to church at all, end quote. Well, before we start addressing that, you'll notice that he says that it's a recent attack on tithing. This, this is the exact same thing he did about Christmas. He actually does this in a lot of places. Oh, this is just a recent thing, even though he doesn't have any clue what he's talking about. And that should be obvious at this point. I mean, we're 10 teachings into this. You should be getting the idea that Stephen Anderson does not do his research. He doesn't understand what he's talking about. So... Just to give a couple examples, let's go back to Charles Spurgeon again, right? Like we did that with the Christmas thing. Let's go back to that. It'll give us an example, and we'll see that even in the 19th century, tithe was not preached in the New Testament church. Now, this was given more towards the turn of the 20th century. And so it was at this turn of the 20th century is when the church buildings that we like the church organizations, the denominations, which again are not biblical, denominations are not biblical, but the denominations began to increase the frequency and, and invented this storehouse tithing sermon that became standardized preaching once they realized how much money they can make. And it started with the Wesleyan Church, and then a lot of other people picked up on this thing. And that's something I talk about more if you go into the search bar at creationliberty.com, type in the word tithe, T-I-T-H-E. There is an article called, Is Tithing a Christian Requirement? And read through that and get an understanding of it because tithing is absolutely not required and it is not even taught in New Testament doctrine. Okay, and so to give you an example where he says, oh, the, Anderson says this is just recent attack. Well, let's read from Charles Spurgeon in which he said, quote, it is also noteworthy that with regard to Christian liberality, there are no rules laid down in the word of God. And, and I understand what he's saying there. When he says when it's coming to the liberty of Christians, we don't have specific rules. Like, for example, is it a godly thing to do to have a computer? That's not answered in Scripture. Because we're given liberality with things, okay? That means we have to judge certain matters for ourselves. And that there may be some people, and I have met some people, that think that they should not be on a computer because it's not right for them to do so. I remember a guy that contacted me a long time ago where he only contacted me through his wife's Skype in which he would he, he wanted to talk to me on Skype, and we sat down and talked about it. And he's like, well, you know, I can't really be on the Internet because it's too much of a temptation for me for, I think it was for, like, for pornography and things like that. So he says, I can't be on the Internet. And so he gave up being on the computer pretty much at all, for the most part. And he had his wife and family help him with that as he went through that process. So... Anyway, for a Christian to decide whether or not, for some Christians it might be right to have a computer, for other Christians it might not be right to have a computer. And so, I mean, that's the type of thing that we're given Christian liberality for those things. And he says there's no rules laid down in the Word of God. He continues and says, I remember hearing somebody say, I should like to know exactly what I ought to give. Yes, dear friend, no doubt you would. Let me pause here again because he's right. No doubt you would. That is what, if you look into your hearts, most of you understand this point. And I have, I can totally understand where you're coming from on this one too. Everybody, all, all of us really should. It's almost like we want this rule set. Just tell us exactly what we have to do to be right with God, so that way we feel better that we're right with God, right? It's, it's like everybody wants this instruction of exactly, here's what I want you to do here, and here's how many times I want you to do it, or, you know, here, go and uh, say 10 Hail Marys and 10 Our Fathers, you know, like the Catholics do. Go and do this, or, you know, get on your prayer mat and pray to Mecca like the Muslims do. It's always they want this instruction of all these things that they should do to be right in the sight of God. Of course, those religions, they don't worship the Christian God of the Bible. I understand that. But that's what they want. 
And that's why he says, yes, dear friend, no doubt you would. And that's where people say, that's why they like to say, well, how much should I give? I don't know what I should give. I'm not sure what I should do. Well, just give 10%. Oh, okay, well, I can calculate that out here. That's what they want. But, as Spurgeon continues to say, you are not under a system similar to that by which the Jews were obliged to pay tithes to the priests. If there were any such rule laid down in the gospel, it would destroy the beauty of spontaneous giving and take away all the bloom of the fruit of your liberality. Now, what's interesting about that is that I've taught that. I've taught that so many times to people that the obligation takes away the beauty of spontaneous giving. And that's where I talk about where, you know, like the Christmas gifts or birthday gifts or things like that. It doesn't mean very much when you're obligated to give something. They're like, well, it's my birthday or it's Valentine's Day or it's Christmas. I expect something. What you're doing is then giving out of fear. Because if you don't give or you don't get a gift, what happens? There's the fear of, why didn't you get me a gift? Wait a second, that's operating according to fear, not operating according to love and charity, you see. And what means so much more, try this instead. For those of you who still, because I, I don't personally practice the birthday thing. If you do, that's your business. I, I personally don't. Uh, I have a reasoning for that. If you want to read it, you can type in the word birthday into the search bar at creationliberty.com and find the article, Why I Don't Celebrate Birthdays. That's up to you if you want to read about that, because there's a lot of paganism involved with the, the birthday celebrations as well. But when you're giving those things out of obligation, try this sometime. Try bringing a present to somebody out of nowhere. You have no reason for it. It wasn't because they were in um, you know, an accident in the hospital somewhere and you brought them a gift. Or it wasn't because there was a special occasion, like a holiday or something like that. Just out of the middle of the blue, out of nowhere, bring them a gift and see what happens. You're going to notice a completely different response from that person. And that's what I'm trying to explain to people. When you simply do something, and a gift is not always, oh, let's go buy something and give it to them. Sometimes it's just doing something for somebody else. What, whatever it is. If, they, if there's something, you see something that needs to be done, you just go and do that for them, just to do it for them. You'd be surprised how much, what a, what a different response you'll get from people. And that's what he's saying is, if you're going to lay down a rule about you've got to give 10%, it destroys the beauty of spontaneous giving. He says, and take away all the bloom from the fruit of your liberality. He continues to say, there is no law to tell me what I should give my father on his birthday. There is no rule laid down in any law book to decide what present a husband should make to his wife, nor what token of affection we should bestow upon others whom we love. No, the gift must be a free one, or it has lost all its sweetness, end quote. But wait a second, I thought Stephen Anderson said this was just a recent attack. It's just a recent attack where people are attacking tithe. No. It's, this is only, I mean, the tithing thing is only a 20th century type thing that's come around. That was never taught in the church. There may have been some cults here and there that attempted to do it, but in the church as a whole, this was never taught. Now, don't misunderstand when I'm quoting this. I am not familiar with the works of J. Vernon McGee, so I don't want people to come at me and just say, oh, well, you know, Chris, he taught this, this, and this. How dare you quote him? I, look, I'm not familiar with his works. I, I don't know if he taught the truth of the gospel or not. I'm simply making a point with this that it wasn't just in the 19th century, but in the 20th century as well, it was still generally rejected. It's only from the popularity of it making a lot of money that it was taught, okay? And there was a lot of people, I mean, a lot of different denominations just started picking this up because it made so much money, but there were still churches that were teaching, no, you're not supposed to be doing this. And so let me quote him from the 20th century here in his book called Through the Bible. He said, quote, Again, I would remind you that we are not under the tithe system today. There are many humble believers with very little income for whom a tenth would be too much to give, end quote. And I agree with him on that note. There's right, there's, uh, and I, I explain that. If you go get our tithing teaching, I explain why that is the case. 
So these are just a few of many examples we could give that could be to demonstrate that Steven Anderson, once again, is either completely ignorant or he's lying. I don't know which one it is. Neither of them are very good. He's trying to create an idea in the minds of his listeners that the church has always taught tithe or Christmas or any of these other things that he likes to do, his traditions that he wants. He's like, the church has always taught this. He's in Stephen Anderson world. He's stuck in this box of Stephen Anderson world and does not understand the church, again, because he doesn't have the spirit of God in him. And the truth is that Anderson often lies. We've already seen that. And he keeps himself in willful ignorance because he thinks he'll have an excuse. He's like, well, if I'm blind to it and I don't look at anything, then, you know, I just put my head in the stand and I'll, I'll have an excuse when I stand before God. He's not going to have an excuse. He refuses to research the truth of a matter, even though he knows there's a problem. So what does he mean that Christians who preach the truth about tithe are against going to church? Because that's what he said. I'll quote it again. He said, quote, if you notice who's behind the attack on tithing, it's people who are against going to church at all, end quote. Hmm, that's interesting. What does it mean that they're against going to church? Because I'm against tithe, because it's totally unbiblical in the New Testament. But I am in favor of gathering together with believers in the church. So what does he mean by that? And many of you are the same way. Because, I mean, Hebrews 10, 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. We assemble together, right? And we're not supposed to forsake that for other things because it's very important. Because as Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone. And that we're supposed to stick together because this, the things of this world, it's a lot of times it can get very, very hard to deal with. Sometimes it's very, this world is very grievous and afflicting and we need one another for that. And so that's why he says we ought not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Okay. As the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. So we ought to exhort one another. That means we urge them unto righteousness and urge them unto doing the right things according to Christ. If, all of, if we're in favor of assembling ourselves together, and we are assembled together here today, okay? I mean, we have people joining us from all over the world over Skype right now, actually, from Africa and Australia and England, and some people that make a lot of effort to assemble together because some of them will stay up to the wee hours of the morning to make because they're in a different time zone to make sure we're all here together. Some of them who are getting up at the crack of dawn to make sure that we can all assemble here together, they're making a lot of effort to make that happen. So we have a lot of people here that are not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, but we also know that, that the storehouse tithing sermons are a lie. And they're, they're against the gospel of Christ. So this is a very manipulative and deceptive tactic from Anderson, because what he actually means by those who are against going to church, he actually means those who do not pay for or cannot afford a large building to meet in. See, he's talking about meeting in a church building. So anyway, in short, what he's attacking here are home churches. Anderson believes that every step he has taken in his so-called ministry has been God-inspired, and that if you don't do everything exactly the way Stephen Anderson does them, then you're not biblical and you're not of Christ. He manipulates people to think that those who expose his false doctrines on tithe are rebellious against the church, and he is not the only one I've seen do this. I could give you stories, and I might mention that something like that in a little bit, but I could tell you stories. I have seen pastors do this repeatedly. It is not just Stephen Anderson, but we're going to expose him along with these other pastors so you see the truth of this matter. So what this means is that we're first, before I can even begin to address his false doctrine on tithe, we're going to have to address his false doctrine on church buildings. So now we're going to go to his teaching called the House Church Movement, which says, quote, The House Church Movement is unbiblical. This is Stephen Anderson saying this, okay? He says, keep in mind, I'm not talking about a church that starts meeting in a house and then eventually outgrows it. I'm talking about the movement that says that if you were ever to outgrow the house, you should split up the church so it can stay small. It, by the way, I've never heard that argument ever made. 
we'll, we'll get to, I know I really want to stop at each of these and start talking about them, but I'm going to go through my notes on this one and try to make sure I stay on point here. We're going to talk about all these points. But he continues and says, in the book of Acts, they started with 120 people and grew from there. I don't know about you, but I can't fit 120 people in my living room, end quote. Now, the first thing we need to address is that this is a logical fallacy. What he's attempting to do here is called poisoning the well, right? Because I'm first addressing his statement that, well, those who attack his doctrine on tithe are behind going to church at all. That's called poisoning the well. In a formal argument, it sounds like this. Person one makes a negative claim about person two, therefore the claims made by person two will be false. Nobody's going to understand that, so let me simplify it. Billy tells the schoolmaster his side of the story between his fight with Dave. Billy warns the schoolmaster that Dave is a well-known liar, so anything Dave says will be a lie. That's called poisoning the well, okay? Because Billy is attempting to create a situation in which anyone who listens to his argument will only believe him. Well, you shouldn't believe Dave because Dave's a well-known liar. So what Anderson's doing here is saying, well, guys, you hear these people attack on tithing? Well, guess what? They're rebellious against the church because they don't even want to gather together. He's poisoning the well. You see how this works? That's a logical fallacy. He's not actually addressing the arguments that are being made. And he wants these people to believe him and not even go research what the other side has to say. They, he just wants his listeners to take his word for it. And again, his aggressive and yelling speeches helps to incite fear into his audience so they will fear him more than they fear God, and that'll make him more believable. And in fact, Anderson has done a, a... I mean, at this point of everything we've covered so far, he's done a number of logical fallacies, including the false dilemma, which is you give two options, neither of which is correct, the ad hominem attacks, which is the railing accusations he makes, the demonizations which is another one he's used repeatedly, poisoning the well. We just talked about the straw man arguments that he uses. That's where he sets up a straw man that nobody's making this argument, but he attacks it and knocks it down and says, see, I won. He, that's, that's straw man arguments and red herrings he likes to use all the time. It's where you're giving another topic. He's addressed on one argument, but then he gives another topic and he sidesteps it. A red herring was, it's, it's a herring's a fish. So the, the idea was that if a bear's chasing you and you throw the herring behind you or throw it off to the side, the bear will go chase the herring instead of chase the target he was originally after. And so that's the concept of a red herring is that they're chasing after an argument that was not made. It's not staying on point. Anderson does this repeatedly. Okay, all he uses. And the, the thing is, he uses a lot of these logical fallacies in conjunction with one another. So much so I could write books on Anderson doing this novels. I mean, volumes worth just analyzing Anderson's teachings. It's basically where he's trying to create a situation where it's Anderson versus everyone else who is not Anderson. Where he likes to make everyone else seem like they're stupid without seeing any quotations or references from these people. He likes to make up arguments that people like, like myself that we're not making and then distracts you from the topic at hand. He's done this in almost every teaching he's ever done. And again, I believe part of the place where he learned to do this, what these wicked false tactics, is from false preacher Jack Hiles, because Jack Hiles did a lot of the same things. So to give you an example of Anderson's not the only one who does this, I rebuked a pastor here in Indiana where I live for abandoning the preaching of the gospel in favor of the politics he adopted. When I worked with their organization, I had people thank me because they said, you know what, in the presentations you give and the things you talk about, you are the only person that's presenting the gospel of Christ. Everybody else is, because I was, this is a creation science organization. They're called Creation Evidence Expo. They're based out of Indianapolis. And when all these people would get up and they would give all these science presentations, nobody's giving the gospel. I was the only one who was doing it, and I, have, I would have people come and thank me for doing that because nobody else was doing it. But the pastor, you see, what happened is that we worked with him for about a year, but he found out through the grapevine that we had a home church. And he doesn't like home churches. And it, it took me a while to figure it out. But I remember he tried to have private conversations with me in which he was hinting at the fact that I shouldn't be involved in a home church. So he didn't like the fact that we had a home church that we met at every week. He tried to get me to go to and join another one. My wife and I 
even tried to appease him for a time, but we were having some difficulty getting into this because they wanted us to do a bunch of things. They had like had all these hoops they had us jump through, like we had to watch this uh, 24 hours worth of seminars and workbooks on, on marriage before they would even let us join the church. It's all sorts of this absurd stuff that they we were having to do. And we couldn't get through it all fast enough. And because we didn't get it out in a timeline that he wanted, he kicked us out. And then he told me the devil was manipulating me. And then he went on a little crusade to contact every church building and leader we had ever been in contact with and told them that we were rebelling against the church, just like Stephen Anderson does, right? He'll tell them we're rebelling against the church, even though that's not true at all. And we were even trying to appease him and all these little things, he, these little political games he wanted to play. In fact, he lied. And the reason he had to go to all these people and do that is because we went to all these church buildings and they wanted, they were asking me to come back. We see, he didn't want me going around to these people in his inner circle crowd to be giving presentations without his supervision. So he went on his crusade to do all this, right? Uh, in reality, what I was trying to do was defend the gospel and rebuked him to correction and repentance. I said, you have lost sight of the gospel of Christ and you're playing this political game. And I was calling him to, come to repentance to come out of his tradition and do what was right by Christ. But instead, he did exactly what the chief priests and the Pharisees did in the New Testament. This is exactly what they did too. We've been reading the book of Acts in our first half. We've been going over this for many months now. You guys have seen this repeatedly, the same example. This is what they do. You want to understand what the Pharisees do, then study the New Testament scriptures and see the kind of things that they did. And then you should see, wow, this is what we ought to expect that they will do when we call them to the righteousness of Christ. So this man, he clung to his tradition. He said all sorts of evil against me falsely to the point to, that still to this day, we do not have one church building in Indiana that supports our ministry. Not one. I've been in contact with many of them. Not one will support us in anything we do. But that's okay. Don't misunderstand. This doesn't concern me. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff we can talk about here on this one, but John 4.44 says, For Jesus himself testified that a prophet, ha prophet hath no honor in his own country. I totally understand that, okay? And what's amazing about that, and I got I to gotta point this out for total hypocrisy reasons, <laughs> is that their organization still sells my DVDs of my teachings. Number one, I gave them no permission to sell my materials. I don't give anybody permission to sell my materials. I tell people you can give them away for free, but you can't sell them. And second, if I'm supposedly rebelling against the church, then why are they selling my teachings? They shouldn't even be giving them out if I'm rebelling against the church. See, the hypocrisy, I mean, when it comes to money and titleship of respect, hypocrisy knows no bounds. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 11, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad. For great is your reward in heaven. So, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Don't misunderstand. I don't want to, I'm not saying this because I want people to feel bad for me. It doesn't really matter. If they, if they want to go and say all the things they want, that's fine. People have always been trash talking and you know they, they make all the railing accusations and everything like that. They've been doing that for, I mean, since the very beginning, since I first started this about 10 years ago. Actually, it has been 10 years now. Yeah, it's been over 10 years now. And since the very beginning, they were doing this. Nothing's changed. And they're going to continue to do this. So you don't need to feel bad in any sense. It's like, oh, well, you know, he's so oppressed. Anybody who's of Christ gets this same stuff. Anybody who's working evangelism and doing the work of ministry, they get these things if they're doing what's right. But as I said before, the only reason Stephen Anderson gets this stuff is because he goes out and tries to start trouble instead of just doing what's right. So getting back to the, uh, his quote about you know, church meeting in homes. First of all, it should be pointed out that Stephen Anderson's faithful word, Baptist church, also started out as a home church. Well, what kind of hypocrisy is that to say, well, you know, home churches are bad, but he started out as one. So... What Anderson does is instead he adds a stipulation. He says, quote, I'm not talking about a church that starts meeting in a house and eventually grows out of it, end quote. Or in other words, what Anderson's saying here, I'll translate that for you. He's saying, everybody else except me. That way he can deceive people into thinking he's not a hypocrite on the matter. 
See, because if he runs into anybody who's got a local home church, he says, well, you need, what he'll do is what every other pastor I have ever seen do. This is what they do. Oh, well, you guys need to link into us. That means you need to stop what you're doing and come to our church building and join the rest of us. Instead of, oh, hey, that's great. I'm glad you're here. How can we help you in your, you know, as you guys are evangelizing to the local community here, how can we help you or how can we work together? That's never the way it's approached. It's always approached as you need to stop what you're doing and come join us. Because after all, then all the money that's flowing through the home church there will be added to this pastor in his church building. And then he, he grows, he becomes more popular, he gets more respect, and he gets more money. But not, I have never heard one ever confess that. I have never once in my life heard a pastor confess those things, that he does that. No one. So obviously they must not exist, right? <laughs> all the warnings of Scripture of all these wolves coming in to devour the sheep and make merchandise of us. Well, I guess none of it must be true, right? Or is it that nobody admits to it? That's a question for you to discern for yourself. So ultimately what Anderson's arguing here is that the group you meet with does not outgrow the size of someone's home, then you're not a real church. That's what he's claiming. He says if you don't grow large enough to outgrow somebody's house, then you're not a real church. Remember, he claimed that these people are against going to church at all. That's what he said. Meaning that if they, be, if they meet with believers in someone's home, then they have not yet grown to the size that they can no longer meet in someone's home, and so therefore none of them actually go to church. It's so manipulative. You see, the, the, and he, it's amazing to me. I listen to this guy yell at other people for playing semantics when he does it all day, every day. He's the king of playing semantics. He's the king of playing these word games in order to, to not really defining what he's talking about so that way nobody can really know. And therefore, Steven Anderson can never be proven wrong. I'll prove him wrong as much as need be so that people will... I, I want my brethren to be warned about vicious men like this so they stay away from them. Again, Jesus Christ had explained the parable of the seed that fell on good ground, okay? He's saying those, the seed that falls on good ground is someone who's actually born again in Christ. And he says, those people, well, I'll read it to you. He says in Matthew 13, 23, He that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it. So it's not just someone who hears the word like Stephen Anderson. It also has to be somebody who understands it because the Holy Spirit gives them understanding. Stephen Anderson doesn't have understanding. You can have knowledge of all sorts of scripture. You can go back to other preachers and learn from them, which is exactly what Stephen Anderson did, and then repeat their teachings over and over. You can have a huge amount of knowledge. Do you know how much knowledge the Pharisees had of the truth of the Torah, the truth of the law of God? They had lots of knowledge of it. They were very well educated in it, but they were not of God. They had no understanding. You realize you can teach that which you don't understand, right? It can be done. But, he can, but Jesus continues and says, Where, which also beareth fruit. Some bringeth forth some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Not everybody's going to bring forth the same amount of fruit, okay? As trees do not always bring forth the same amount of fruit. The Lord Jesus Christ did not say that every Christian would bear the same amount of fruit, but Stephen Anderson believes otherwise. So not only is Anderson teaching a false gospel, like on repentance and things like that, and he also tries to defend sins like witchcraft and different things like that. And he has the emulations and the railing accusations and all these other things. But he also says that anyone who bears fruit of 30 instead of 100 is therefore going against the church or against going to church at all, which is unbiblical and beyond absurd. That's not what Jesus taught. You're saying that your living room couldn't fit 30 people? But he claims those are people who are against going to church at all. And like I said, we have a home church that meets online. Well, how do we outgrow online? <laughs> I mean, how do you do that? You can't really do that. I mean, if and of course, I also want to address this. He says they're a part of a like a house church or a home church movement. 
I don't know if there is any such organization. If there is, I am not a part of them. And our church is not a part of them. All I did when I was starting this up, I read the scriptures, saw that the early Christians met in their homes, and concluded that despite what I was being told, we didn't need a fancy building to justify Christians assembling ourselves together. So we got together with me, and it was basically me and my mom and my sister, we got together, who were Christians, and we started studying. And we had people join and people leave, and people join and people leave, but now we've grown more and more, okay? And so the members in our church are generally, and you can talk to them if you want, you can go onto our forum, you don't have to take my word for it, you can ask them, but their members in our church are generally thankful, because they talk about it a lot, that they've learned far more about the Word of God in a few short years with us being together in our church than the decades that they were attending traditional 11 church buildings, including Anderson's Faithful Word Baptist denomination. I mean, many of us grew up, I mean, I did, I grew up going to church buildings for decades before we got to this point. And so did many of the other people that, that are in our church. They, they went to all these church buildings for decades and decades and had no understanding of doctrine. Because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Leaven is false doctrine. Leaven is blindness. Leaven is the sin and the wickedness of the heart. Those things, a little bit in the church, leavens the entire lump. And so that's why you have to separate from wicked men like Stephen Anderson. But because of his, the brainwashing that Anderson, the brainwashing techniques he uses to manipulate his audience, now he has a bunch of people who think they can't have a church unless they pay money for a separate building first. And folks, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying it's wrong, and I hope that I never have. I don't believe I ever have. I'm not saying it's wrong to have a building where you meet in. If I have ever said that, I do apologize if I have. I, but I don't believe I've ever said that or made that argument. I'm not against having a building where you meet. Okay, my, When I've always talked about the church buildings, I am always referring to, and I hope I clarify this now so that people are not confused, I'm talking about church building mentality, church building philosophy, because it's a templeized philosophy that we have to have a temple of God and build all these temples to God. The temple of God is the body. That means your body. And that would be the body of Christ as a whole, okay? There is not denominations. There is only the church. You have churches that are in different locations. That's totally understandable because that's even referred to in Scripture that way, okay? You have the church of Galatia, the church of Corinth, but all of them were the church as a whole. They were not different denominations. But all this separation has happened because they are not of one accord, not of like mind. But the problem is the church building mentality, once you get into this church building mentality, you start to bring in all sorts of other false doctrines because they become traditionalists. That means they focus on tradition rather than focusing on what the word has told us. Okay. They have this attitude of the, you know, taste not, touch not, all these things, right? Like what the Bible says, it gives that attitude of those things instead of showing the liberty that we have available. Now, of course, we need to abstain from sin, we ought to abstain from the pollutions of idols, abstain from fornication. That's not what, I, what the Bible's talking about when it says taste not, touch not, you know, that sort of thing. But it's talking about where th there's they're given no liberty. And that's what we're kind of addressing even with the tithing issue here, and we're going to get to that later. But what Anderson doesn't tell people initially is that the building they meet in isn't paid for by his church. Faithful Word Baptist Church doesn't do that, as far as I know. Anderson pays for it out of pocket because that building is the same building he conducts his business in. So they meet in his business storefront. Explain to me the difference between meeting in a home church and meeting in a building you use for your business. How exactly is that different from meeting in someone's home? Because Anderson pays for it. It's a security business he owns and operates. Well, the answer to that is just Stephen Anderson's a hypocrite, and it's a contradiction. He's just willingly blind to these matters, okay? Anderson's basically just like a larger size home church. That's all it is. Anderson also fails to mention that as soon, as soon after Acts 2, the Christians were being hunted and executed, and they had to hide. It's not like they could come out like Stephen Anderson's church building and have giant signs out front that says Faithful Word Baptist Church on it. It's not like they were doing that back then because they would have been rounded up and killed immediately. 
They spread out in homes in different areas to fellowship with one another, but according to what Stephen Anderson is telling us, we would have to conclude that the early church in the book of Acts was unbiblical because they didn't buy large buildings for fellowship. That's ridiculous. Continuing on in his house church movement, as the teaching is called the house church movement, he says, quote, not only is it unscriptural to intentionally stay small. Now, notice that he says intentionally stay small. We'll have to see what he means by that. He continues to says, but the tr typical house church lacks leadership. If God intended for the New Testament church to be free for to be a free for all, where everyone has equal authority, why did he give us such strict qualifications for an elder or bishop? The pastor has to be somebody who's been in the church for a while, has the aptitude to teach, etc. End quote. Now, we're going to have to break this one down, too. We're still breaking down. We're adding to the breakdown of the first quote he did, because I'm not done with that one either. But now we're going to have to break this one down even further. Faithful Word Baptist Church, I would like to add in, lacks biblical leadership, too, because they've got a wolf in disguise running it. Anderson acts exactly the same as every other 11 traditional church building operates. He's a pastoral king who expects everyone to respect his person, and if they don't, he will personally remove them and brand them a heretic. That's what he always does. Notice that he says intentionally stay small there. I'm going to hone in on that one. That's what he's doing by poisoning the well. That's what I meant by that, okay? He's claiming that anyone who has a home church means to intentionally stay small. Again, that's a fallacious argument. And it's totally unscriptural. First of all, I've never even heard of that. I Until Stephen Anderson mentioned it, I have never even heard of someone who says, guys, we're a home church, but you can't join because we want to stay small. I, that's absurd. And of course, Stephen Anderson fails to give any example of anybody teaching such a thing. He doesn't actually mention that. I'm not saying that no one ever does, but he, because I, I don't know about everything of every cult out there that teaches whatever, but he's trying to make it seem, and this is what I mean by poisoning the well, he tries to make it seem like anybody who has a home church intentionally wants to stay small. He says, they're not like me who grows. Oh, it's ridiculous the way he does this. So it's a fallacious argument, and part of the reason Anderson's cult has grown to the size that it has is due to his exposure to media which he purposefully seeks out, okay? Remember I, I talked about him being a media whore in previous parts? And that's exactly what he is. He appears on ABC News and USA Today and Fox News. I mean, he absorbs as much media attention as he can possibly get. That's why he's grown, not because he's teaching the truth. And he's filling up his church with a bunch of false converts who are cultists that are blindly following him. It means the fruit that Anderson's bearing is not coming from good ground. It's a corrupt tree. And as Jesus said, a tree of corruption will be hewn down and cast into the fire. So just as a side note, I mean, the fact that international and mainstream news outlets, which are run by those who serve the devil, that they're willing to feature in interviews with Stephen Anderson, that ought to be a major red flag in the mind of any Christian. I mean, why is it that the devil would allow him to be on his television programs? I mean, the devil is never going to have the mainstream nerve service publish the truth about Christ. So we have to ask ourselves, why did Anderson get featured in the first place? Besides the fact that Anderson bows the knee to all those who will give him public exposure. So just keep that in mind. But Anderson also says that home churches typically lack leadership. Now, he says typically, first of all, typically lack leadership. Of course, what he's saying is all home churches except for me, obviously, because the great and powerful Stephen Anderson has spoken. But he gives no examples of it. Show us a home church that, that lacks leadership. See, leadership starts with the apostles. Apostles are what we know as, like a lot of people use the term missionary. Missionary is a Catholic term. But an apostle... They go out in twos, that's the way scripture described it. They go out at least in a team of two, sometimes a little bit more, depending on how much you need. But the apostles will lead the church until it's large enough that it requires leadership. The apostles didn't preach in an area, have three people born again, and immediately bring them all into the church and make them all elders. That didn't happen. 
But this gets more confusing because I'm going to have to give another quote here. I know this get, it's, it's getting a little complicated. I'm going to address everything as we go through. I'm just going through my notes here. But let me address this too. In the house church movement teaching that he does, he says, quote, The house church people will say they are all elders. What? <laughs> I have never seen that. Now again, perhaps I'm just missing. Maybe he's he's found one or two here or there that's that said such a thing. I have never seen that. And that's not biblical. And we certainly don't operate that way. So why is he generalizing this to say the house church people will say they are all elders? We have a home church, but we don't say we're all elders. But he continues and says, but are they really qualified? Well, again, in the scripture, what, what, qualified, what qualified Paul to be an apostle? Jesus shown himself as a light from heaven and says, Paul, I want you to go out and teach my word. And Paul said, okay, that was it. That's what qualified him. You know what qualifies Stephen Anderson? He went to seminary college and he does, <laughs> he's basically a cultist that has done all these things followed all these traditions and followed all these false preachers and therefore everybody should listen to him. That's what qualifies Stephen Anderson. The only thing that qualifies me to teach is that the Lord Jesus Christ told me in his word that's what I ought to do. That's it. I have no other qualifications, guys. I am simply a worthless, weak idiot who is incredibly and foolish in his life, who had no understanding that God gave mercy on me he brought me to repentance, showed me mercy. I have faith in the blood of his son, and he has raised up this rebellious idiot in order to give him some understanding so he can teach these things. That's it. And anybody, he can give that to anyone. I, I, there's, I think some people were emailing or, or writing on a forum earlier this week saying some things like, well, I want to learn to teach things you know, like how you're teaching them. And I said, well, you have to rely on the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't rely on me because that doesn't come from me then it's it's almost like you're putting faith in me, my ability. Don't put faith in my ability because my ability is nothing apart from the Lord God who gives it to me and he can give it to you too. So you need to pray for the things that, that God will give to you as well. And, and we don't know if he has something in plan. I thought God had a plan in mind for me at first. And as things, as I grew and I understood more and studied the word more, I understood that those things had changed over time. So, we need to make sure we gain understanding from him in all things and not from ourselves. But Anderson continues in this and says, At Faithful Word Baptist Church, we don't have an overabundance of qualified guys. Even in a church of over 300 people, faithful men who are actually qualified to, to pastor a church are hard to come by. Those house churches want to have multiple pastors in their living room, and what they have is too many chiefs and not enough Indians. End quote. Now, the term too many chiefs and not enough Indians is a phrase I've, I've heard. I actually heard, I always remember hearing that most often from my mother concerning her time as an employee of Walmart. Walmart has too many chiefs and not enough Indians, <laughs> in which there's too many bosses. Because you should have, you know, one, two, or three, or whatever, depending on the size of what it is, have a certain amount of bosses at, who are overseeing a number of different people. That's the way it should be, okay? So... First, he's argued that home churches, now if you remember what I just quoted from him, he argued that home churches don't have enough leadership. Remember when he said that? They don't have enough leadership, and now he's arguing that they have too much leadership. Which one is it? <laughs> Again, which Stephen Anderson are we supposed to listen to? Do they not have enough leadership, or do they have too much leadership? I mean, basically, Anderson is making the claim that if you don't purchase and upkeep a separate building outside of your home and have a single pastoral king ruling over it, then you don't have proper leadership. That's exactly what he's arguing here. I'm showing it to you. Anderson believes that the only person, like only one person in the church should have the aptitude to teach, and that's because he doesn't understand the role of evangelists, prophets, and pastors. We have evangelists in our church outside of me who teach. They don't, I mean, they don't necessarily teach in our church, but they're teaching. And, and all of us in general were taught to teach. Jesus said, I send you out into the world to teach all nations the things that I have taught you. 
he gave a great commission to all of us that we're supposed to be doing that. Now, of course, there are certain rules and stipulations you have within the church. I understand that. Like women are not be to be permitted to be teaching authorities over the church and things like that. That's not that's not supposed to happen either. But at the same time, God will send certain teachers, and there doesn't have to be this one singular pastoral king ruling over everyone, because that's nowhere listed out in Scripture that that was supposed to be the case. Because where is it that you have this example of a ruling entity over the entire? over everyone, basically. Well, that's generally seen in Catholicism, where you have a priest that rules over everybody else. And now, I, I understand that there are elders in the church, but those elders, and again, in, the elders generally make decisions together, okay? And it's generally over things like, okay, we got to make sure that we understand what we're teaching here, and we need to establish those things, and we also have to establish, okay, what are we doing with, you know, okay, does this person need help? Are we going to raise funds for this? That sort of thing, okay? It's not to oversee the lives of every single person and all of everything that they do, because, again, there's liberality in those things. And there's not this heavy-handed type of leadership that you typically see in these church buildings. And Faithful Word Baptist Church probably has elders. I wouldn't doubt that. But I guarantee you, all those elders strictly follow Stephen Anderson. Because if they don't, guess what's going to happen to them? Same thing that happens to everybody else who dares to question the holy sacred cow called Stephen Anderson. And if you want to learn more about that, we have an article called Is the One Pastor Church System Biblical? Which you can find if you go to creationliberty.com. Uh, just type in the word pastor, P-A-S-T-O-R, and you'll find that article and get more information on that. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying there should be tons and tons of teachers in the church either, okay? Let's go to the other, other side of that coin. I'm not saying that should be happening either because if you look in like to James chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. So don't be many, many... It's talking about teachers in that context. Don't be many, many teachers everywhere. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, starting in verse 3, it says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall heap unto themselves teachers, having itching ears, and shall turn their ears away from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. And what he's talking about there is that you're going to have, like, for example, what's happening today. You have a lot of people that will go and they'll listen to teacher after teacher after teacher after teacher. Like, for example, there's a number of people who are in, like, for example, I've got YouTube videos on, right? And you've got, even though we're not a YouTube ministry, I just, YouTube videos are a convenience for me to help organize teachings. That's what I do. All the stuff that we have is on the website. I don't publish everything to YouTube. But that's where a lot of people tend to uh, miss that point. But you have people out there who will go and listen to me, but then they've also gone and listened to Steven Anderson. And that's why you have a bunch of subscribers that we have on my YouTube channel that hate that I'm doing this teaching because they've heaped unto themselves teachers. They have teacher after teacher after teacher after teacher after teacher after teacher over and over and over all over the internet and they heap unto themselves th these teachers because what they'll do is they'll hear one teacher and they're like, well, I don't like it that he says this, this, and this. So I'm going to go to this other teacher. Now, I don't like it that he says this, this, and this, but then he does that better than the other guy. And so what they're doing is they're combining all these teachers together. And really, what are they doing? They're not sanctifying themselves. There's no sanctification there. That's the problem. And I did an article on that called The Biblical Understanding of Sanctification. You can probably just type in the word division, D-I-V-I-S-I-O-N. And that'll give you more understanding of why Jesus said that he came to bring division, to, came to bring that separation, which is what sanctification is, is setting apart for a holy use. So what they'll do is that even though they'll run to a teacher that's teaching leaven things and false doctrines, they will continue to listen to that person, even though they, should, they really shouldn't be doing that. If it's a leavened doctrine, then a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And so what they should be doing is sanctifying themselves. And they say, well, no teacher's perfect. Yeah, but you know, you, when you have a teacher that's unrepentant of teaching false doctrines, you should move on and, and separate yourself according to that. But that's not what they do. They go to teacher after teacher after teacher after teacher because they're picking and choosing what doctrines they want to hear. It's picking and choosing which ones I want to listen to me, myself, personally, deciding for myself, instead of looking at, okay, what does the scripture say on these things? 
So it's it's kind of like a smorgasbord of teachings, and it's like almost like a, a buffet. They're going and picking which ones they want and which ones they like to hear because they're heaping unto themselves teachers having itching ears because they will not endure sound doctrine. Because there's always, folks, if you get to somebody who's teaching what's right, there's always going to be a point in time where they're going to start teaching something that you don't like. I'm not saying that they're going to be perfect in everything that they say and do, but again, correction is grievous unto him that forsaketh the way. And I've taken a lot of correction myself, and I've demonstrated that even publicly on our forum. I do have a section on there which I post where I do corrections at, and I've got more to make. I've even found out, I even got letters this week of a couple of errors that I made, and I've removed a couple things, and I'm going to be doing some studies on that stuff and reworking those things, and then I'll issue corrections later once I get those things figured out. So that kind of stuff I'm actively doing. Now you go and try to correct Steven Anderson, you see how he reacts. Try it and see. But with growth comes an assortment of gifts and calling of God, and Anderson rejects that because all should bow to the pastor, according to him. And if you think that's not true with Stephen Anderson, keep listening to this series because I'm going to show you later that's exactly what he does. Later on, I'm going to show you. He tells people, you better remember that my first name is not Stephen. My first name is Pastor. Just wait. He says this, and I'll show you. We're going to get to that later. Anderson is the sole ruler over the church. And that's just clear by looking at his faithful word, Baptist Church. The New Testament also mentions prophets and those who deliver the word of God for rebuke and correction and, you know, evangelists that go out and do these things. And But Stephen Anderson, he rejects the prophets. He rejects evangelists. He rejects those kind of people because all need to follow Stephen Anderson. Now, Anderson, in his house church movement teaching, he continues to say, quote, What it boils down to is pride. House church proponents don't want to pour water on the hands of Elijah like Elisha did because they think it would be degrading and demeaning. Elijah wasn't perfect, but he was a man of God. A smart person like Elisha gets behind a qualified man of God and learns from him. End quote. You want to talk about pride? Anderson is comparing himself to Elijah. <laughs> That's what he just did. What it boils down to is pride. Do you see the hypocrisy? It's like hypocrisy is this dripping poison that's just flowing out of his mouth. And it's like these people are completely blind to it. To compare Anderson to Elijah is absurd. And Anderson accuses everyone else of pride, then claims he is a qualified man of God like Elijah, and that everyone should just get behind him, which is typical of cults, by the way, where the cult member ignores the prideful statements of their guru. We ought to learn from those who have come before us in the church who demonstrated love, righteousness, meekness, patience, and faith, but we ought not to follow after wicked cult leaders like Stephen Anderson, okay? In 1 Timothy 6, 11, it says, But thou, O man of God, flee these things. Follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Now, as we're going to end today, what we're going to do is go over a video that I just added last night. And what I had asked, I went on our forum and asked to do, uh, some of our, our church members and other people on our forum to do, is just give some scriptural analysis of what we're going to hear at this point. And I'm going to, I'm going to pause and, and give you those scriptures as, as they come up, because I put them in the video. What I did is I, I wanted the church to just give the scriptures that came to mind when they were listening to what Stephen Anderson's about to do here. And then go ahead and what I was going to do is just take those verses and put them in the video, which is what I did. Okay. So what we're going to hear here, I want to give you the context. This video is about six minutes long. and I'm going to pause in a couple places and make some comments, but it's Anderson firing one of his employees, a man by the name of Tyler Baker. Now, in this, I am not defending Tyler Baker in the video because, and I don't know who the guy is, but I'm not defending him because in the video, he claims to believe that Jesus is the Father. Folks, let me be very clear. Jesus is God, but Jesus is not the Father, all right? That would be an unbiblical doctrine to make such a statement. And if you want to learn more about that, there's an article we have at creationliberty.com called, Is the Trinity a Biblical Doctrine? I just type in the word Trinity into the search bar at creationliberty.com, and you can uh, get more information there. Of course, the Trinity 
is itself a Catholic term, and it's based on paganism, but God in three persons is legitimate. I don't want people to misunderstand, because usually when I say that, they're like, oh, he doesn't believe in the Trinity. No, no, no. The concept of God in three persons, I believe in that. I don't have any, any objection with that, but the Trinity itself is actually based on paganism. But there are, God, there are three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are not the same, but they are together God. Okay? And when somebody comes along and says Jesus is the Father, that's false doctrine. They are teaching that which is not true. If you want to learn more about what all that means, again, go get that article and learn more. But also, Tyler Baker does seem to have slacked on his duties as an employee. Okay? Because he even admits that, he confesses to that in the video. But what I want to point out is how Steven Anderson handled the matter, okay? So I want you to, to hear what Steven Anderson is saying here. And you can see his hateful, warmongering, railing attitude. It's clear as day to see once again. So let's take a listen, listen to this. Elliot Ray knows about it. Henry Martinez. And Russell Bob. And they're all on board with your one as well. They believe in that. How did that happen? That's what it is. Yeah, I said it's the name of the box. Yeah. Do you want to Google it right now? One this thing? Yeah, I know that that's the one. Yeah, yeah, that's what it is. Yeah. So let's not play games. By the way, I want to make sure that I mentioned everybody that. This took place, it was uh, June 19th, 2017. The recording's a little poorly done, that's why it's hard to hear some things. Because somebody, it almost seems like, secretly did this on their phone. I want you to understand that all this is taking place, and he's firing this guy while Tyler Baker's wife is in labor in the hospital. I just want to make that clear. I put a line through. I'm taking your word for it. I just confirmed. I put a line through everything. This is unacceptable. Okay, now let me ask you this. Did the word polytheistic come out of your mouth in regard to our teaching on the Trinity? Not my mouth. Whose mouth did it come out of? And what did you say? I, I do not agree that, that you believe in a I don't care. What did you say? I don't care what you I'm mean. sure I've said it before. You said what? I've probably said, said that I said that it's similar to polytheism. Yeah. I, said, I said that it came wow. from the Wow, wow, the Trinity's polytheistic. Because it's I said not a made man in our image. Yeah. Polytheism too. That's right. Unfreaking believable. I joined Josh Hall last night at some barbecue or something. I was not. You're going around telling everybody about Babylon. You're telling everybody about your oneness Pentecostal crap. You suck as an employee. You have sucked the whole time you've worked here. You go around singing your own praises. I have been this close to firing you. All right, before we can continue here, I'll, I'll give you one of the first ones that somebody had posted. They said, above all things, and this is from 1 Peter 4, starting in verse 8, above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging, as every man hath received the gift, so even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. So that's uh, one of the first ones that they were they were giving. Again, these are these are scriptures that others in our church came forward and were giving when they were listening to this. Every month, the only reason I kept you around is because I don't want to rock the boat. You're leaving anyway. You know, if I had to work with you for the rest of my life, I would have fired you a long time ago. You are lazy. You suck. You've never done anything that I told you to do beyond the minimum. Any extra, hey, try to work on this, try to get this up. You do the minimum of everything. You phone it in. At the best of times, you're a C minus. He can say that. Garrett will say the same thing because we've observed your habits of doing nothing and people to move there just because they just want to move there. And I thought it was great and I was encouraging people. But now I find out it's because you're talking crap about our oh, church God. and telling them how your church is going to be better. Pastor, I promise I'm not doing that. I promise. Well, first of all, when people say, I promise I'm not doing that, those, typic those types of people typically are liars. That's why I say I'm not defending Tyler Baker in this. When somebody has to say, I promise I'm not doing that, it's the same thing as saying, I swear I'm not doing that, that you're adding to your yay and your nay. See, when you're doing that adding to yay or nay, that usually indicates somebody who does lie. Because somebody doesn't have to add on all these stipulations. Well, you know... Uh, here's the truth, and you know, uh, here I'll give you a pinky promise. You know, that's that's ridiculous. That's not uh, a biblical thing to do. But again, 
Uh, here's another one from 1 Peter 5, starting in verse 1. The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, feed the flock of God which is among you, take the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. I promise to you, you're a liar. I, we, I promise you, Pastor, I promise from the bottom of my heart what you that I'm not trying to split the church. You believe in the oneness? I don't, I believe that yeah, Jesus is the Father. And Jesus only. Jesus is the Father, that's heresy. I did not think that it was that big of a deal. I honestly yeah, did not. Yeah, the Trinity's kind of a big deal. Somebody's a liar. And I think it's you. Because your life doesn't, matter. your testimony sucks right now. So I'm, I'm, I think you're the liar, but we'll find out on Wednesday night when we take you before the whole church and we find out what's really been going on. We'll find out who you've been talking your oneness crap to. Be an idiot and play semantics with me. I'm not going to play your stupid game. You understand? <laughs> Do you see that, that Steven Anderson saying? He's like, I'm not going to play your game where you're using semantics with me. Steven Anderson uses semantics all the time in all of his teachings. And I'm not oneness, it means that Jesus is the Father. That's a stupid doctrine. It denies the Trinity. It's false. You understand? I don't believe in it. And you say, hey, I don't want to talk about that like you promised me that you would. You told me, you little liar, that when people came to you and asked you about it, you said, hey, I don't want to talk I about that. I did that multiple times. That, that is the truth. I did yeah, but now I guess time. you're all high and mighty now because you think you're leaving. You can do whatever the hell you want. You're leaving in a month problem. and a half. You think you can just suck as an employee. You don't do anything I tell you to do. You do nothing. What the hell did you do for 50 hours last week? I well, let's go to 1 Peter 5, 5. Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace unto the humble. Yeah, I, I, I agree that I have done a lot worse than yeah, you. Yeah, you suck. You suck. No, you suck from the beginning. You always suck. Okay? I told my wife, I told my wife that you're a C-minus. Yeah, and you started. I told Roger he meant it. Okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the only two people. Because I don't go around talking crap about you. Yeah, I told my wife that you're a C-minus. Yeah, and you started. I told Roger he meant it. That's the only two people. I told my wife that you're a C-minus. Wait, 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 wait. He, I'm, I'm sorry. He just said, I don't go around, this is his quote, I don't go around talking crap like you. But he just said that he went to his wife, he went to one of his best friends, and he was talking crap about him behind his back. The, he, he just told him that's what he did, and then says, I don't talk crap about people. <laughs> it's hard. I'm laughing because I'm having a hard time figuring out how someone can be this blind. Here's another one I, I got. It's 1 John 4, 8. He that loveth knoweth not God, for God is love. Yes, friend, and my wife, that you're a bad employee. And I told them that a year ago. Well, then don't screw up your life, idiot. You don't want to face the conflict. In case you didn't hear that, he says, don't screw up your life, idiot. Because, I mean, his, his wife's in labor in the hospital, and that's what he says to him. So you want to try to split the church? You know how it's going to split? It's going to split the same way it always split. You and your couple of the hell out of here, and 99% of people are going to stay, and this church is still going to run. Uh, that's not from everything I've heard. It sounds like they have a room. I mean, from based on the, the testimonies I've seen and other eyewitnesses, it sounds like they've got a pretty big revolving door in there. Um, so, I mean, it's not. I'm not saying that people can't just, you know, leave a church you know come and leave and come and leave because that, that happens in lots of places but you know when he says 99 percent are going to stay and all this that's just that's him you know feeding him a bunch of garbage uh here's another one from first Thessalonians 5 11 it says now we exhort you brethren warn them that are unruly comfort the feeble-minded support the weak be patient toward all men on 300 and i don't care if you take half the church with you Go ahead. Good riddance. If people are that stupid to believe in this oneness stupidity, then good riddance. This is a Baptist church. This is not a charismatic church. That's what you've been doing. Here's another one from 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 25. And we've already quoted this one in this teaching, but let's give it again. It says, And the servant of the Lord must not strive. That means he's he's looking to, to pick fights, right? But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Doing nothing and then teaching that. You're not helping the church at all. You don't help it grow. You're taking it, you're, you're trying to destroy it. Huh? 
not. Yeah, you are. I'm you're sure. you're not talking people into going there because your church is better than I not. promise I don't. Exactly. I have okay. never okay. one time asked anyone to go to my church. One time, I promise. Well, somebody's I lying. promise on everything. I never one time asked anyone to go to my well, church. church in the world, but what about one that's even better? You didn't say that. No, not no. I did not say those exact words. No. <laughs> I didn't say those exact words. So you said something like that. I said something similar. Yeah, you're not saying saying stupid stuff like that. Exactly. I didn't want to do this to you when your wife's in labor. I don't hate you. I love you. I love you, Pat. I love you, too. Oh, what a bunch of lies back and forth. Oh, I love you. I love you. Do you remember what I was talking about? The the lovingness is shown by the action, shown by the attitude, shown by a lot of those things. But they're sitting up hearing the I love you stuff is just vain words of nothing falling on an empty floor. Okay, I love you too, but you know what? I didn't want to do this to you while your wife's in labor because I know that being in labor, and you shouldn't tell her this until it's over. Because your wife being in labor is hard enough on her. Or I'll just feel bad for her. Now. I feel bad for her. Yeah, yeah you are. Get out, because I'm going to call you out in front of everybody. And you know what? If, if what you're saying is true, then I guess everybody will just say it up to you. I don't know what I have no idea. Well, you know what? I'm going to call Steven Anderson out in front of everyone too, which is what I'm doing on these teachings. When he says things, and I'll just quote him here, he says, quote, You suck as an employee. You suck the whole time you've worked here. Your testimony sucks right now. Don't be an idiot. Play semantics with me. I'm not going to play your stupid game. I guess you're all high and mighty now because you think you've, you're you leaving and do whatever the hell you want. You've sucked from the beginning. You've always sucked. I told my wife that you're a C-. Don't screw up your life, idiot. End quote. Well, what, what is that telling us here? This should tell you pretty much everything you need to know about Steven Anderson. And there are people we've removed from our church too, but we don't have these kind of conversations like this with them. I mean, they have gotten... We can show you tons of evidence of they have acted this way to us, but we've never acted that way to them. Because, I mean, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 2, it says, A bishop must be blameless. Now, a bishop is an elder. That's what that is. The husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler. You know what a brawler is? If you get a diff like Webster's Dictionary definition, it means somebody who's really noisy, who's loud, who yells and rails and things like that. That's a brawler. So Stephen Anderson is not qualified to be an elder. He's not qualified to be a pastor. He questions, well, are these people in these home churches qualified? Yeah, they're a lot more qualified than you, Stephen Anderson. And in verse 7, it says, Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without. Do you think that outside, for his neighbors and all that, that this guy has a good report? No, he doesn't. He's not qualified. He's a wolf. But the world... I mean, well, and, and that's that's the sad thing about this is that the world is using this false preacher as an example of Christianity when he's not of Christ. They use Stephen Anderson as an excuse to tarnish the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and falsely accuse those of us that are in his church. I mean, Christ's church, that's what I'm referring to. Those of us who are in Christ's church get falsely accused because of people like Stephen Anderson, because of his wicked words and actions when the evidence is clearly showing us that man is not of Christ. And if any, if after hearing that, any of you believe that Anderson is actually a real Christian and a real pastor and deserves to be in the, in the position he's at, then you are blind and willingly so. So anyway, that's where we're going to end this week. And next week we're going to pick up and continue on this one. Then we're going to switch over to talking about the truth on tithe. And talking about, I mean, we're going to go into a lot more details on this about ordainment and different things like that in, in, uh, concerning like the church and what it's supposed to be. And then later on, and I know it's coming up here, the part I, I can't wait to do because it's going to be so much fun. But the part where he teaches that if you're a true man of God, if you're a true American patriot and a preacher who's preaching the truth of God's word, then you're going to pee standing up. I kid you not, he teaches that. And I will show you the evidence of it because we're going to listen to him do it. So hopefully we'll get to some of that uh, next week. Did anybody have any questions or comments about anything we talked about today before we close?
Well, thanks for joining us, everybody, this week. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless and protect you all as you seek to study his word and glorify him and all that you say and do. And God willing, we will see you next week.